Hi everyone, my name is Victoria. I am a registered kinesiologist here at Cambridge Cardiac Care Center. And today we are discussing how your heart works. So really the goal of today is to just to get you thinking a little bit more about heart disease and what that really means. Some of this will be a little bit more scientific, some of it will not be. So I just hope that you're able to take one new piece of information away from our discussion today. And then, of course, if you have further questions, make sure that you do reach out to your cardiac rehab team, your doctor or your family doctor, just to make sure that your individualized questions do get answered. So starting off, what does the heart do? So if I was doing this lecture live in front of patients, I would ask the class this and hope that someone would say the heart is a muscle, right? This muscle pumps blood. So every heartbeat or muscular contraction of the heart, the heart is sending oxygen rich blood around your body. Um, so anywhere from your head to toe, it's your heart's job to pump and make sure that blood is being delivered where it needs to go. Your heart is on the left side of your chest and it's about the size of your fist. So if you have a bigger fist, you have a bigger heart. This is some more anatomy for you. So talking a little bit more about the different structures of the heart. Your heart has four chambers. The two upper chambers of the heart, those are your left and your right atrium. And then your heart has two lower chambers. So that is your left and your right ventricle. So different times throughout the cardiac cycle or when this heart is beating, blood will be passing through these chambers to get kind of, you know, where it needs to go. Your heart also has arteries and veins, just like the rest of your body. So the biggest artery of the heart is the aorta, and that's visualized up here. And it's of quite a significant size because it's going to support that left ventricle in pushing the blood out where it needs to go. And then this is just one of the veins. So this is the superior vena cava, and it's formed by two uh, brachiocephalic veins, if you want a little bit more science behind it. Um, again, all serving a different function. And we're going to talk more about arteries and veins on the next slide. Your heart also has valves. So that's pictured. One of the valves is here. There's four valves of the heart. And valves operate as doors. So essentially, they're going to open and they're going to close to allow blood to flow through the heart. And they help to make sure that the blood does not flow the wrong way through the heart, which is really important. And then behind the heart here, we also have the lungs. So we know that the heart and the lungs work together. That's why when you're exercising and you're working hard, your heart rate's going to increase as well as your breathing. So that just shows you a little bit of the interface between the heart and the lungs. But essentially to sum up kind of how the heart works, really what happens is the heart is going to squeeze or push out oxygen rich blood. And that's going to go head to toe to the rest of the body. Um, the body's going to use up that blood with oxygen, and then it's going to go back to the heart, and then the blood gets pushed out to the lungs to go get more oxygen. So the lungs are where we kind of pick up oxygen. Once the blood has oxygen again, it goes back to the heart to then be pushed out to the rest of the body again. And this cycle repeats kind of over and over. And I'm going to show you a nice visual on the next few slides. Talking a little bit more about arteries and veins. So your blood is not just, you know, free floating through your body. There's arteries and veins that carry it. So these are kind of like highways throughout the body, if you will. And arteries carry oxygen rich blood away from the heart to the rest of the body. So the way that you can kind of remember this is that arteries start with A and away starts with A. So arteries are sending blood away from the heart with oxygen, and then that blood with oxygen gets used up. And then veins, on the other hand, carry deoxygenated blood or blood lacking oxygen from the rest of the body to the heart, and then it goes back to the lungs to pick up some more oxygen. So just with like anything in science, there are some exceptions. So the pulmonary arteries, these are the only arteries that carry deoxygenated blood and then the pulmonary veins are the only veins that carry oxygen rich blood. So there's always some exceptions, but you know, a general rule of thumb is that arteries carry oxygen rich blood away from the heart. And then veins are going to carry deoxygenated blood 
you know, from the rest of the body back to the heart to then go to the lungs. So how does the heart work? We're going to break this down a little bit more, but we know the heart is a pump. The heart has an electrical system or operates as an electrical system. The heart has valves and the heart also has blood supply. So we're going to break down each of these a little bit more. Okay, so um, we know that the heart works as a pump. This is normally kind of the first thing we think about when we think about what the heart does. And I think this visual does a really great job. So as I mentioned earlier, with every heartbeat, the heart is going to squeeze or you know push that blood out of the heart to be sent to the rest of the body. And then it's also gonna take a moment to relax and fill up with blood again to then be pushed out. So again, a really great visual for you here. So when the ventricles expand, they fill up with blood. And then when they get smaller, they're squeezing that blood out to get to where it needs to go. And then the valves of the heart are these white structures here. So really just showing how these doors open and close to allow that blood to flow in the right direction. And sometimes things can go wrong with the pump of the heart. So the middle diagram here is kind of what a normal heart would look like. And I'd like you to pay attention to the left ventricle, this chamber here. Um, sometimes the heart can become weak and have an issue with pushing or squeezing blood out. Uh, historically, this has been known as systolic heart failure. We typically now call this heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HEF-REF. And that's because this left ventricle becomes big, saggy, and baggy. And that muscle weakness then makes it so the heart has difficulty pushing to squeeze out that blood. So that affects how much blood is being expelled from the heart. So again, that's known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, or what can also happen now, if you take a look at this left ventricle, um, this muscle has now become so stiff and fibrotic and hypertrophied that it can squeeze out the blood, but it cannot open up and fill and relax to get that blood back in. So this has been historically known as diastolic heart failure, which we now call heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEF-PEF. How do we kind of look at heart failure? How do we find out kind of more about it when it comes to patients? Echocardiograms are really important. So that's the ultrasound of the heart. It looks at all the different chambers, you know, the valves, that sort of thing, and paints a nice picture. Um, if there's something going on with the ventricle, like we've kind of shown in these two pictures, normally we're able to detect that nicely on the echocardiogram. Um, chest x-rays are also kind of used as well as some things on blood work. So there's one marker in your blood work that's called BNP. And that is a you know number that looks at stretch of the heart. So normally patients with symptomatic heart failure will have that elevated BNP because it shows that there's muscle weakness, the heart is more stretched, that sort of thing. So symptoms that we wanna watch out for is normally fluid retention related symptoms. So worsening shortness of breath, you know, waking up short of breath at night, gasping for air, being unable to lay down flat, maybe having to sleep, you know, in a chair or with multiple pillows to kind of be more upright, um, you know, ankle swelling, leg swelling, that sort of thing. So those are all signs of fluid retention. And we know patients with heart failure are really susceptible to holding on to fluid. And we also know that salt is what tells our body to hold on to fluid. So that's why we're really strict about, you know, sodium restrictions, because if you have more sodium, you'll then have more fluid. And if there's more fluid floating around, this weakened heart has to work harder to do its job. So really making sure that you're restricting your sodium is crucial, you know, reading food labels, that sort of thing. And some patients, if they exhibit these signs of fluid retention or become volume overloaded, they may need to take an extra diuretic or water pill to make them pee more to get rid of that extra fluid. And then we know the heart is also an electrical conduction system. So we talked about how the heart is simultaneously, you know, first it'll beat, squeeze out, and then it'll take a second to fill up again and then squeeze again. Um, something in the heart has to tell the heart to beat. And that's when we start to think about the electrical system. So you can think of the system, basically the heart is comprised of a bunch of different nerves that run through the middle of the heart and up the walls. 
And in this little atrium here, there's a pacemaker cell called the SA node or the sinoatrial node. That's going to fire the electricity down the heart, up the walls, and that's going to tell the heart to beat. So somebody that has a pacemaker would normally have an issue with really slow and you know low heart rates or really fast and high heart rates. If you get a pacemaker implanted, that's going to help try to keep the heart in regular kind of rhythm and, you know, maintained heart rate. So that electricity that's being fired through the heart becomes more at a regular pace instead of being too slow or too fast. If you've heard of cardiac arrest before, uh, you may have had cardiac arrest or know someone that has, that is when this electricity through the heart stops being fired. So somebody with cardiac arrest would not have a pulse because that electricity that's telling the heart to beat or contract has not been fired anymore. Another common arrhythmia that we think about, you know, relating to the electrical system is atrial fibrillation or AFib. Uh, again, this is an arrhythmia disorder. So essentially, if I go back to my little slide here, when you have AFib, that electricity that's fired from our pacemaker cell is a lot more erratic and kind of out of normal sinus rhythm. Um, there are different types of atrial fibrillation, and this is normally manifested as like, you know, you could feel your heart racing or a fish in your chest is kind of something used to describe this. You may also feel unwell at this time. So, you know, dizzy or faint, nauseous, sweaty. These are kind of the signs that we normally think of when we think of AFib as well as like a chest pain. Um, different types of atrial fibrillation. There's paroxysmal AFib. This is also known as PAF. This is kind of like episodic AFib. So it comes and it goes and usually resolves on its own, normally treated with lifestyle and medications to help prevent you from having reoccurrence of the AFib. There's also persistent, which can last over a week and be ongoing. And then there's permanent where your heart cannot be restored to normal rhythm after trying, you know, different types of procedures like cardioversions or ablations, that sort of thing. So again, some of the ways that we manage AFib are with lifestyle, you know, exercise, diet, the medications that you take to help rate control your heart, as well as blood thinners to prevent the risk of stroke. And then sometimes there'll be someone that will undergo cardioversions or ablations to attempt to restore the heart to a regular normal sinus rhythm. Okay, so your heart also has valves. So we talked a little bit about valves earlier. These are the doors of the heart that open and shut to allow blood to flow through. And this is kind of a nice visual of a normal valve. So it's going to fully open and then it will fully shut. A regurgitation, uh, this is when the valve doesn't fully close and it will actually kind of leak out and blood can travel the wrong way through the heart. This is also known as a leaky valve or your valve can have a stenosis or a narrowing. Sometimes we call this like a sticky valve and that's when the valve doesn't open enough. So instead of the valve opening like this, like a, a really wide open here and dilated, it may look something like this. So a lot more narrow. Uh, again, depending on the severity of the valve issue, it may just be a matter of you know monitoring for symptoms, medications and lifestyle management. But if one of these issues becomes more severe and very limiting, like, you know, experiencing a lot of shortness of breath or that sort of thing, that's when the surgeon and doctors may suggest doing a valve repair or replacement to help fix up, you know, either the leaky valve that you're having or the stenosis that you're having. And then your heart also has blood supply. So there are many arteries of the heart, but on this slide, we're just talking about kind of some of the main coronary arteries. So your right coronary artery is over here, your left coronary artery, which then splits into the circumflex and the left anterior descending artery or the LAD. And all of these arteries supply a different amount of blood to the heart. And again, we know that there can become issues with your coronary arteries if you develop a blockage or plaque. So again, over time, as we age, we know we will develop some plaque that is fairly normal, but there are things that can accelerate this process. So all of our kind of modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors that we always speak about can accelerate the process of plaque building up. 
And if you think about it, your heart's a muscle, so it requires oxygen to live. And if there's something that's kind of, you know, blocking or plugging up your arteries, then that oxygen is going to struggle to get back to the heart. Um, this is typically manifested as angina or chest pain, true angina or cardiac chest pain. That's when the heart muscle is deprived of oxygen, and that's typically how it would manifest. Um, if that happens for a prolonged period, that can cause you know, a blood clot to form and rupture and cause a heart attack, that sort of thing. Um, depending on the severity of the coronary artery disease, you may get a stent or a bypass. Again, these are, you know, surgeries, procedures that are done to help make sure this plaque doesn't become as problematic for us anymore. So again, over time, this plaque can build up. Um, the warning sign of the plaque building up would be that angina, that chest pain. It could be a tightness. It could be a heaviness. It could be a, a burning, a stabbing. It can really sound different from patient to patient. That's why if you are a cardiac patient and you're getting angina and you're prescribed nitro spray, you should always make sure to use your nitro spray. So what would really happen when you get a chest pain? If you think about it, if this is my artery and my plaque is building up here, that's going to limit the oxygen getting back to my heart. When I take my nitro spray under my tongue, it's going to go going to open up that artery, basically give more room for that blood to flow, and then oxygen can return to the heart. So nitroglycerin is a life-saving medication. Again, it could be in the form of a, a spray or a tab and sometimes a patch as well, depending on your history. Um, if you take your nitro tabs or patch, make sure that you're always seated when you're taking it because nitro is going to dilate all the arteries it will bring down your blood pressure. A side effect is like a headache. You might feel kind of dizzy out of sorts, that sort of thing. So make sure you're always seated when you take your nitro and always wait five minutes between nitro sprays. If you need, you know, three nitro sprays over the course of 15 minutes and the chest pain is still persisting, that is when we would normally tell you to call 911 and make sure that you are seeking medical attention. We also encourage you to make sure that you're not getting up after using nitro for at least 10 minutes. Again, just with the blood pressure kind of dropping that sort of thing, we wanna give your body time to kind of recover from that. And then these are the things that we wanna think about as well. So our risk factors for heart disease are kind of what, again, modify our risk for heart disease. There are non-modifiable risk factors. So these are the things that we don't tend to focus on as much because we can't change them. It's important to know because it can give you more insight onto kind of, you know, the type of situation that you're in, but we don't focus on them because we can't really change them. So even if you wanna change your age, unfortunately we haven't figured out how to do that just yet. Um, you know, genetic predisposition, so your family history, your race or ethnicity, and then sex assigned at birth can all of course, you know, affect your risk for heart disease. But then we like to think more about the modifiable risk factors. So these are the things we do exhibit some control over. So obesity, diabetes management, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, smoking, alcohol misuse, you know, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity or lack of exercise, and then other psychosocial factors. These are the things that we do exhibit some control over. So again, that's why we focus on them. We now know that 90% of your risk for heart disease is actually modifiable by you. So the attitude that, you know, I don't have to know any of this. My, my doctor takes care of me. doesn't matter to me. It's not the best attitude to have, right? Because there are things that we know now that we have under our control that are super, super important. Okay, so at this point, if I was presenting live, I would ask the patients in the class, you know, do we have any more questions specifically about your heart? Of course, if you have questions after watching this session, I would encourage you to reach out with your cardiac rehab team. And then of course, Cardiac College is another great resource that you can have available to you. So you could just go on to your Google, search up Cardiac College, and then under the Treat Heart Disease tab, uh, lots more information to be found there. And then just kind of recapping what we spoke about today. So we talked about how the heart works and kind of what happens when it doesn't. And I hope you were able to take, you know, one new thing away from our session. Uh, that's all from me today. Thank you so much and have a great day.